What's going on guys, Ben Brewster here at TradeAthletics.com. Today we're going to be breaking down Tristan McKenzie. Uh, I know a lot of you guys saw him pitch this, this past year during his debut and we're wondering how does this guy throw so hard weighing so little, as skinny as he is. So we're going to get into that, we're going to break down his mechanics, uh, what he does well, maybe some of the things he doesn't do as well, and then I'm going to address at the end of, end of the video, uh, you know, why is he so skinny, would he throw even harder if he was able to gain weight, and maybe some suggestions for what I would do about that if I was coaching him as well. So with that being said, let's get into the video and let's break down his mechanics. So first, some quick facts for those of you who aren't familiar with Tristan McKenzie. Uh, so he's listed at 6'5", 165. Apparently he's gained five pounds since he was drafted out of high school, so that's great. He's 23 years old. Uh, he was a first round pick out of high school, 42nd overall pick. In high school, he was 89 to 93, reported to have a plus curveball, and one scout said he had one of the quickest arms he's ever seen. He debuted in August of this year, late August. He only threw 33 innings, but he struck out 42 in that time, uh, only walked nine. He's had a little bit of an injury history, so last year he didn't play in 2019. He had a right subscap uh, strain, and he also had a pec major strain. So interesting note there. His fastball really does play up. It has uh, its top 10 in the league, at least this year, in terms of vertical break. So it plays up as far as its movement, and you can see that right here in terms of the ride he's able to get on that fastball at 96. As far as velocity, he averages 93 with that, so uh, right around big league average as far as velocity. Um, but again, he is able to get that up to 97. He uses it about 53% of the time, and his uh, his average spin on that is about 2,300 RPM. So uh, nothing right, nothing there that really jumps off the table, except that ability to create uh, that carry or that vertical break on his fastball. That's just kind of an overview of McKenzie. Let's get into some of his uh, mechanics. We'll kind of go through this frame by frame, and I'm just going to kind of show you guys what I'm seeing and kind of break down what he does so well that allows him to create this velocity with such a slender frame. So the first thing uh, mechanically, uh, it's not really about his movement patterns, but kind of just jump at you immediately is his intensity, his his intent to throw the ball through the catcher. So you can see he absolutely explodes at that last second. The ball just jumps out of his hand, um, but he really is trying to throw the absolute piss out of the ball. And that's just a really uh, common trait amongst most of the hard throwers. The scouts obviously look for this kind of effortless velocity, and, and that's great if you can find a guy who does that. But in general, most of the hard throwers are the guys who sequence their delivery well and then try to throw the absolute crap out of the ball at the last second. So uh, intent, I know that's kind of a buzzword and you know it is kind of overused especially in a training context at times. But when it comes down to it, most of the hard throwers do throw the absolute crap out of it. It's just well sequenced and well timed within the delivery. And he does an exceptional job and we'll get into that as far as delaying bringing the upper half and the arm into the throw too soon. So there's a, a huge amount of intensity here, but you can see he's kind of deliberate and lets that intensity build till the very last second. So intent is one of the things that I would say he does for, uh, very exceptionally well as far as well sequencing it and delaying it till the last second uh, before he applies that intensity to the ball. All right, so let's take him into his leg lift and let's, let's examine that a little bit. So you can see right off the bat, he has a little bit of a higher leg lift. Some things to note here. So first off, he keeps a very quiet upper half, very quiet uh, head and torso position as he gets into that leg lift. A, a lot of guys will kind of uh, dip or, or kind of lean back. He's not doing that. He's staying stacked. He's staying tall through his torso. So that's a plus. You'll also see that as he lifts the leg, he's getting what I'll refer to as kind of a pelvic tuck. He's getting kind of that posterior tilt with his pelvis. There's two things that I like about this, and it's a very common trait amongst a lot of hard throwers. The first is that it shows that he's generating the move from the center of his body. He's not just lifting with his hip flexor, but he's using the center of his body to kind of initiate that movement and swing that leg up, which is a plus. As much as you can, uh, being able to kind of control the center of your body and move from the center of your body is very much the goal as a pitcher, being able to control yourself proximally uh, to distally. So that's an indication that he's really utilizing the middle of the body well. It's a pelvic driven move. Uh, the other thing that I like about this too is that you'll see kind of in this position, this initial starting position, where his center of mass is, it's more or less kind of centered through the middle of his foot. But what that high leg lift with the pelvic tuck does is it helps shift that weight more towards the heel. So now if we kind of look at him, if we draw this kind of center of mass line, it starts to shift back a little bit. So it goes from being kind of over the center of the foot to as he shifts back and tucks that pelvis, it brings the weight more on the heel. And you can try this yourself. You stand up, stand on one leg, hold your knee. Now bring your knee all the way up to your chest and let it tuck the pelvis. You're gonna feel your weight shift into the heel and you're gonna feel like you're very grounded into the heel. 
and that you're stacked and tall over that heel. So I like it because it helps set up a, a better move into the hinge and it gets you really tall and stacked and into the heel. But again, it also shows that he's able to control everything from the pelvis and from the center of the body. So that's what I'm seeing as far as the leg lift. He doesn't have a huge drift or a huge forward move during the leg lift. So you see there's a very slight initiation of his, of his, uh, his weight shifting forward at that point. The other thing he does well at this point is he's not tipping the pelvis super uphill. We see this commonly as well as guys try to throw too soon and they try to get into the back leg too soon and their very first move is to tip the pelvis uphill and start reaching with the hips. Does a good job letting that kind of tempo build, not trying to do too much with his leg lift, but beginning to initiate and set up some of these good positions for the next move, for the forward move or the hinge. So let's talk about that now. Let's take him into his forward move and kind of see what's going on there. So as we take him into the hinge, uh, the first thing that I want to kind of point out is that he's patient out of his leg lift before he gets into the hinge. He's not immediately getting out of his leg lift and trying to drop into the hip. He's allowing this movement to naturally flow right here. These frames right here, he's kind of letting his body float down out of that leg lift before he gets into that hinge or into that back hip. So he's not just immediately here and trying to drop, he's letting it kind of flow, then he drops into the back leg. So it's a well-sequenced flowing movement. But then once he does get into the hinge, right here, that's when he starts to really drop into the backside. So you can see, let me play this in full speed just so we can see it again. You'll see there's a really aggressive drop once he actually does get into it, into the back leg right there. So he's, as he comes down to the leg lift, he's patient, but then once he gets into it, he really does drop into the back leg, and he does so in a way that doesn't ruin his, his sequencing or his body's organization. So as he drops, let's look at where his pelvis is. So he's got that level pelvis, he's got level shoulders, he's stacked over the pelvis in that position. As he drops into the back leg and into this hinge, let's just track where his pelvis goes. So you can see that pelvis is maintaining, he's maintaining this torso stack and he's maintaining this level pelvis as he moves down into that drop. So it's an aggressive move, but he's maintaining that organization of the upper half as he drops into the hinge. It's not leaking forward, it's not pushing off and jumping off the rubber. It's building tension, holding into the back leg and riding that stacked position down the mound, moving from the middle. Talked about a little bit there, um, keeping a stable knee and pelvis and maintaining his posture, but if we kind of look at, at the position of his foot, as he drops into that back leg, what allows him to create that stability and create that, that good forward move is that he's able to put good ground force into the back foot, into the, into the rubber. So he's not trying to put as much force as he possibly can. He's not trying to just absolutely push the rubber away but he does have a stable back foot position, which gives him the ability to ride the center of mass forward. So we look at that position of the foot, again, very limited movement through the foot. You don't always see that. Sometimes you'll see kind of the ankle caving out into a little bit of supination. You'll see a little bit of instability in that back foot in certain guys. And it's very tough to create a good forward move. Guys tend to come out of their back leg early when they don't have that stable back foot or that stable back knee position. You'll see that they, they don't have the ability to trust that forward move and so they'll come out of the back leg early. And that's a common flaw that we'll see all the time that you can clean up to a certain extent by improving that not only ankle mobility, but ankle stability on the back leg. And this is one reason, just as a side note, why certain guys will throw significantly harder outside in cleats, is they're able to get better grip into the actual ground and it gives them more stability to actually produce that forward move and produce power out of. So to go along with that, because he's got that stable position, he's really able to hold that hinge for a long period of time. Let's kind of let's count the frames from when I would say he starts his hinge to when he kind of ends it. So right here, he's not quite in the hinge yet. He's kind of in between. Right there, he kind of drops into the back leg at this point. Now, how long does he hold that position where he's in the back foot, pelvis over the, the femur, stacked, building tension? How long is he holding that forward move, that hinge? So one, two, three, four, five, six, right there he starts to go. So about six frames. Now that's this move right here. But he's able to hold that hinge for quite a long period of time before he actually maxes out that move. Now when I say max out, there's only so much range that you can actually get down the mound before you, 
you start to trigger the pelvis to actually go, and that's largely dictated by the range of motion that you have. So the ability to abduct that, that hip, um, a lot of times guys are limited by adductor flexibility as well. But how far can you move down the mound while holding that stable connection? There's gonna be a point at which you max out that available range and it's going to trigger that opening of the hips and that opening of the pelvis into landing. So he does a very good job of holding that hinge for a long period of time. Common flaw that we'll see with slower throwers or lower level throwers is that they maybe get to the hinge for a split second out of leg lift and then they immediately begin to open up. They begin to trigger uh, that lower half uh, rotation too soon. So he's able to delay that for a long period of time as he moves forward down the mound before he initiates that trigger, before he initiates that rotation. Um, so that's another key to his lower half. That's one of, I would say, th that's the thing that kind of jumps out the most at me about his mechanics is how well he, hold, he holds the hinge aside from just his raw arm speed itself. So he also gets downhill very well. And uh, one reason that he's able to do that, if we look at this side view, is that he's not only holding, as we talked about, this stacked pelvic position where he's not letting it tip side to side or front to back, he's staying on top of it. He's also holding that level shoulder position, kind of hard to see on the red, red on red. But as he moves forward, you can see the torso position, the shoulder angle roughly mirrors the pelvic angle as well. And this isn't, again, this isn't necessarily that common. Um, when guys get into that hinge, they have a tendency to want to lean back, to feel like they're loading even more into their back leg and the load becomes this type of movement that just brings them uphill. What happens when you get too much shoulder tilt and shoulder tilt isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but too much shoulder tilt or poorly, poorly timed shoulder tilt it again, requires you to be able to get back to level, get that ship back to level by landing, which again can create timing issues for a lot of guys. They end up at landing being super uphill with a super low elbow, and they're not able to then get that elbow in plane and get those, those shoulders downhill on time. And so there ends up being a lag or, or a delay and a leak of energy. So he does a good job as he's moving towards the target of holding his shoulders level so that as he triggers the hips, the shoulder is already in a position to apply everything downhill. Now, another thing to point out here about his ability to get downhill is that he's cueing a little bit of this elevated glove side. Even though he's keeping his shoulders relatively level, he's still elevating the glove arm a hair, which is helping him cue getting downhill and cue that unloading in plane downhill. So that glove arm kind of matches the arm slot he's trying to create. This is his arm slot kind of that three-quarter, maybe slightly low three-quarter slot, and his glove arm roughly matches that slot he's trying to create, and then he replaces that with his arm. But his actual torso is not leaning uphill. He's keeping that level, and he's using the glove arm to cue that, that downhill rotation into landing. So let's talk a little bit about his actual hip rotation. So he's gotten to the end of that hinge, and now he's, it's triggered this ability of the, the pelvis to rotate. So what's actually going on there? What I cue guys and, and how I explain it is that it's more of a relaxing into rotation or a releasing of this stored tension uh, in the hips than actually trying to brute force and power the hips through. It's much more holding into the backside as long as you can, holding closed, stacked, hold closed, stacked, closed, stacked, building tension, and then releasing that and relaxing the hips open into landing um, versus powering them through. Now. What exactly does that mean? And first off, let's kind of look at him and, and see if you can understand what I'm trying to say. So he's building tension, building tension, building tension. Now he's reached the end of his available range of motion, it kind of cues the, the pelvis to go. That move right there is not a forced move. Now, there are gonna be some pros who would maybe internally their feel is that they're forcing it, but by and large, it's not a force move. It's way more of a flowing dance move into landing with the electricity and the, the intent and the intensity coming at the last second than trying to power the hips through and it just becomes this blocked rotation. So why is that important? Because what happens when you try to force the pelvic rotation is that ironically, you end up creating less separation and you end up transferring less energy actually into the, into the torso. If I try to brute force my rotation and throw the hips forward to create my separation that way. Well, first off, I've injured myself many times in my career by trying to do that in high school and early in college um, because that's not how your spine is designed to work by just creating this massive shear. It's much more of a, it's much more designed to work in this kind of segmental 
uh, flowing way. So that's the first thing is that you can potentially injure yourself, but you're also not able to create the same type of separation by trying to force it. It ends up creating this tension up the chain. If you think about your spine as something uh, literally like a chain, where it's got these different links or these different vertebrae, they're designed to work segmentally. You're trying to transfer your energy through the spine in a segmental wave-like fashion. It's not a blocked forced rotation. And so relaxing into rotation gives you the ability to segment and dissociate the hips from the shoulders and then bring the shoulders in after the fact. So he's holding tension, releases the hips into landing, and by doing so, He's able to hold the shoulders back, maximize that separation, get into a good position at foot plant, and now he brings the electricity. Now the lead leg block initiates, finishes pelvic rotation, and delivers the arm. Relaxing into rotation is something I really believe in because for me that was a, that was a big key in being able to unlock a lot of velocity in my own career by not forcing it, you know, taking off a lot of pressure from my low back, uh, and then just relying on the actual movement to provide the energies. He's able to hold the shoulders back because he's not trying to rotate everything as fast as possible. He's floating into that position of landing and releasing that hinge in the back leg at the very last second. So he's gone through hip rotation. He's now at landing. Now this is what I refer to as closing the gap. Now you can think of the, the initial part of the throw is like opening the gap or uh, creating, this, creating this stretch at this position. He's in his, he's almost at that position of max stretch because technically it happens slightly after foot plant but he's in this very stretched position. Now the idea is how well can I block that energy from the front leg and close that gap. So he's opened the, the loop or the gap, now he's closing it. Now this is, again, what I think he's doing so exceptionally well. He's able to just absolutely explode once he gets to landing and deliver his arm at extremely high velocities. So the first point I wanna make is that arm speed doesn't actually come from the arm. Now, some of it does come from the arm uh, as far as the actual ability to contract and shorten from the scapula, from the pec, all the way down to the fingertips. There is some of the arm speed coming from the arm itself. But by and large, the athletes who have the most elite arm speed are not the ones that if you just isolated their arm and tested them from the scapula to the fingertips, that they, you know, they would throw 90 miles an hour. They're the guys who are able to create their arm speed from their entire body being well sequenced while they're able to relax the arm free of tension and bring it into the throw at the last second. So arm speed doesn't come from the arm, arm speed comes from the body it comes from having a well-sequenced mechanics on top of the arm. So the arm augments what you're already doing through the entire kinetic chain. If you're able to sequence everything very, very well, bring a ton of energy into the torso at the last second, now the arm augments that free energy that you've already passed up the chain, and now it adds to that, um, and that's how you're able to create maximum arm speed, is it's a combination of using your entire body from the ground up, sequencing the pelvis, the torso, everything we've already talked about, and then adding on top of that the arm speed. The other reason he, he's able to close the gap so well is his posture at landing. So he's in a good position. Again, we've already touched on this a couple times, but he's in a position right here where he's still stacked, even at landing, even as he's starting to get into these contorted positions, he's still stacked over his center of mass. So he's not uphill, he's not leaking forward out front, he's in a good position. If you were gonna throw a punch at somebody, you wouldn't leak forward onto your front side to throw that punch, and you also wouldn't be back here uphill. You'd be stacked over your center of mass, not leaning forward, not leaning backward, and be in a good position right there to throw a punch. He's in an optimal position to actually take advantage of that energy from the hips and from the torso at landing. So his lead leg block is another reason he's able to capture that energy so well and actually close the gap. The goal of the, the lead leg block at this point is to capture that impulse and produce ground reaction force posteriorly. So he's able to plant and now he has a stable base on the front leg to complete his pelvic rotation. So he's actually not fully open with the hips at this point. You know, I have not done a mocap on him obviously, but I would say he's probably 45, maybe 55 degrees open at landing, which is again, pretty typical for most hard throwers, but he's not fully open. And so what finishes that pelvic rotation is the lead leg block. Now again, the front leg is gonna be pushing posteriorly the ground reaction force as he plants, and that's gonna work its way through the lead leg and push that left side of his pelvis posteriorly. So for me as a lefty, it would be pushing the right side of my pelvis posteriorly and that's gonna also push the opposite side of the pelvis anteriorly. So the lead leg block helps complete that rotation by using the ground to help 
maximally clear the hips. As he clears the hips, as he gets that impulse from this lead leg block, there's gonna be an instant here where it maximizes his, his hip shoulder separation. So hip shoulder separation ideally is going to peak after front and foot strike. So while you might think that you're in maximum separation right at landing, it's actually a hair after that. It's as soon as the lead leg block accelerates the pelvis, there's a point at which you create that maximum stretch. And so because he has such an efficient lead leg block, his maximum separation is probably somewhere right around here. And that's going to deliver the arm at high velocities. And then we haven't talked about his arm a ton, just because I really wanted to focus on what he's doing so well with his entire body in the throw to create the arm speed. But as far as his arm itself, you know, we don't need to touch too much on his, his arm path. He's got a clean arm path, not too short, not too long with his actual kind of arm swing does a good job spiraling the arm up, does a great job of relaxing the arm free of tension. The arm's up and on time here. So he's right around 45 degrees of external rotation at landing. Typically we wanna see about 45 to 90 degrees of external rotation at landing. So he's right in that range, he's not late. But then specifically what I wanna talk about as it pertains to velocity is that he's able to keep that, that arm in plane very, very well once he starts to initiate torso rotation. So at landing, his elbow is right in line with his shoulders. You can see it right here. And then as he begins to rotate, you ideally want that elbow and that arm to unwind in the plane of the shoulders. So we'll typically see lower level throwers, a lot of them have issues where that elbow is down as they begin to rotate. So the plane of the shoulders is, one, is in one plane, but the elbow is way out of it. And so then the elbow has to find its way back in plane after two or three more frames, and that represents a huge energy leak. So what you want is you want the elbow in plane with the shoulders on time. And then as you begin to rotate, the arm unpacks, goes into layback, and then spirals out and around in the plane of that shoulder rotation. And so he does that very, very well. You can see as he rotates, his elbow's not way up here, it's not way down here lagging. He's right in plane the entire time. The arm unwinds and it's fully extended at ball release, hand right behind the ball. And again, rotating extremely well versus having kind of this linear follow through. So he's doing a lot well from an arm action standpoint. I just didn't want to make that kind of the focus of the video, but that is in a nutshell, how he's able to close the gap from landing to ball release so well. Again, he's using his entire body very well. He's got excellent posture at landing. He's got a front leg block that's creating this impulse that's propelling the pelvis forward, maximizing the stretch and then delivering the torso. Again, and the arm is in plane to fully take advantage of this entire sequence of events. So let's kind of summarize everything we've talked about. What exactly makes Tris McKenzie so unusual? Because again, we've, we've established he's, he's got good mechanics, but he doesn't do anything completely crazy. He's able to close the gap really well, but he's still in similar positions as a lot of these other big leaguers. Like why is he able to have a big league average or possibly even slightly above average big league fastball weighing 40 pounds less than the average big league pitcher. So he doesn't get into deep ranges of motion. He's not creating outrageous uh, hip shoulder separation like a uh, uh, Daniel Espino or maybe a Dylan Cease or a uh, Rollis Chapman. He's not, using, he's not using this ability to apply force to the ball over a crazy long arc, you know, as his way of generating velocity. He's obviously not super physical with, you know, his, his muscle development, you know, from that standpoint, his physique. So how, what exactly is it? To kind of answer this question, I want to kind of categorize pitchers in, in three different ways. And I think this will make a lot of sense when you think about it. The first is fascia driven athletes. Now fascia is our connective tissue continuous through our entire body. And it's largely what allows us to have this elastic component, uh, this ability to store and release elastic energy through our entire body. Every pitcher is going to use their fascia to some extent, but Again, this is kind of on a, on a scale, on a gradient as far as, you know, how guys really prefer to produce their force. So there's, there's fascia driven. I would categorize Tristan McKenzie as kind of a fascia driven athlete. He's more relying on this ability to store and release elastic energy than on active muscular effort. Now we have our muscle driven athletes. This might be someone like a, like a Noah Syndergaard maybe, where they're kind of more relying on this active contribution from their muscles, from their pec, from their lat, to be able to close the gap super quickly, um, and not as much necessarily about, uh, about the fascia and the, the elastic or reactive component. So we have our fascia driven, we have our muscle driven, and then we have our range of motion driven guys where, you know, somebody like a Daniel Espino again, where maybe they're not super crazy explosive, they're not super muscular, but they apply force to the ball over a long period of time um, because of their extreme mobility. And so, you know, that's kind of how I would categorize different pitchers, but he is a great example of a fascia driven guy. Um, this might be, you know, example of an NBA guy like uh, Kevin Durant versus maybe a LeBron James, where Kevin Durant might be kind of a reactive fascia driven guy, a little bit uh, skinnier, but still able to create these crazy, uh, crazy force production just because he's so elastic. 
whereas LeBron James might be more of kind of your muscle driven uh, guy. They're both able to jump out of the gym, but they're able to produce that force slightly differently. The other thing that benefits him is lever length. He's listed at 6'5". I wouldn't be shocked if he had a 6'7 or 6'8 wingspan. Again, I don't have his exact uh, anthropomorphic measurements because I don't train him, but I wouldn't be shocked, again, just looking at him if his wingspan was a couple inches longer than his height. So again, that is an area where uh, that's likely above the average uh, big league pitcher. Obviously, he's very fast twitch and explosive. Uh, I'm sure if we took a muscle biopsy of him, we would see a high proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers. So I, I, even though he doesn't necessarily have the muscle size, the muscle that he does have is likely very high fast twitch uh, proportion. Um, so that is a component of it as well. And then also, you know, just through the grapevine, people that kind of know him or have trained around him, apparently he is a lot stronger than he looks. So he is roughly on par with a lot of these other uh, big leaguers or pro pitchers as far as his actual strength levels. And this likely has a lot to do with the fact that he is so fast twitch. Faster twitch athletes are able to generally put up a lot more weight than you would think given how big their muscle is because they're able to produce that force very, very quickly. And these are all just components that factor into the equation. I would compare him to someone like a Chris Sale as far as that profile as an athlete. Chris Sale is uh, around 6'6", six, six, 160 pounds. He might be more like 170 or 180 at this point. But again, he's relying on levers Chris Sale is reported to have a 6'10 wingspan. He's fascia driven. He's relying on that ability to store and release elastic energy. And then he's relying on just great use of the kinetic chain, great use of using ground force, using the pelvis, sequencing everything well, and bringing those levers into play at the very last second. He would be, even though mechanically they're not uh, super similar, he would be just an example of a pitcher who kind of produces force in a similar way. So I know you guys are all wondering, you know, why exactly is he so skinny relative to other pitchers? And could he throw even harder if maybe he gained some weight and, and he kind of figured it out from that standpoint? So I do want to address that just because I know that's the comment that everyone's going to be posting on here. So he likely has a significantly faster metabolism than the average. We've coached over a thousand athletes now since 2015. You know, you will see athletes, maybe one in a hundred, who have such fast metabolisms that they really do need kind of crazy caloric intakes to be in a, a caloric surplus. By definition, he is not keeping himself in a caloric surplus if he's not gaining weight. So the fact that he's gone from 160 to 165 in you know, five years, he has not consistently been in a caloric surplus. Because by definition, if you are taking in more calories than you eat, uh, than you are burning, then you're gonna gain weight. It is very difficult for certain athletes with such fast metabolisms to actually be in a caloric surplus. You know, he might be the one in a thousand that Maybe he needs 6,000 calories a day with his energy expenditure to actually gain weight. There is a kind of point of diminishing returns where it becomes so difficult to get those calories in that it does become an issue, especially if you're a guy who's maybe on the field four or five, six hours a day in practice or in season. You know, it can be very difficult to get those kinds of calories in during your other waking hours. So there is a point and there is an argument for why it can be very difficult. I don't know him personally. I haven't trained him again, but I have heard that he does eat a lot of food. But again, this is something I talk to my athletes about quite a bit is eating a lot and eating enough to actually be in a surplus are not the same thing. I don't know his situation. He could be the, that one in a thousand where it's just uh, almost impossible. But typically you have a guy who's eating maybe 4,000 calories a day. They say, I eat so much food. And they're right, they are eating a lot of, a lot of food, but maybe they need 5,000 to actually gain weight. And so there's still a disparity between what they're doing and where they need to be to actually be in a calorie surplus. Most guys that we see are capable of gaining weight. The vast, vast majority, 99 out of 100, come to me, they say they can't gain weight and they leave with 15, 20, 30, 40 pounds uh, on them a year later. So it really comes down to being able to establish, hey, am I actually in a, cal a caloric surplus or am I just eating a lot of food? But that's just a lot relative to the average person, relative to the rest of their family, relative to the other teammates, but really they need to be up here. Is that the case? And once you actually establish that they're in a caloric surplus, are you measuring that on a daily basis, tracking that and making sure that you're actually doing that consistently? One of the issues with guys who have such fast metabolisms is that they'll do really well for a day or two, they'll gain a half pound or whatever, and then they'll have one day where they slack off and they lose that. They lose all the progress from five days, they'll lose it over the weekend because they kind of slack off for a day or two. They maybe only eat 3,000 calories for that day and they lose it. And they're just constantly fighting this battle of, of pushing uphill, then dropping back downhill, pushing uphill, dropping back downhill. So consistency really becomes the difference maker when it comes to gaining weight for a lot of guys. And then also just on top of measuring that, measuring your body weight, seeing, hey, is the, in is the input that I'm putting in actually creating the output that I want? If you're eating a ton of food, 
but you're not gaining weight, you're not in the calorie surplus. So you really need both metrics to really tell if what you're doing is working. And this is not to hate on him, this is not to say that he's doing something wrong. He might be doing all of that and he might be the one in a thousand that has, you know, just a crazy metabolism or some sort of metabolic thing where it just becomes extremely difficult. But by and large, if you're watching this video, you're super skinny, you're trying to figure out how to gain weight, it's very doable for 99% of guys watching. If you're interested in that, we do have a free three week weight gain program that you can download. Uh, we have a link in the description that walks you through step by step everything you need to do to gain weight. I basically wrote the guide for myself as a 15 year old kid who didn't know what he was doing. He weighed 155 pounds and it's basically, hey, if I had had that guy, that mentor back then to just walk me through a few weeks of how to eat properly, how to weigh everything, how to track everything, I would have gotten to the point where I'm at way, way sooner. So the guide is basically that. It's explaining exactly how to eat to gain weight, how to measure and track everything uh, for three weeks. After that point, you'll know how to continue doing it on your own. And if you guys are interested in a mechanical consult or exploring uh, what our online coaching has to offer, again, we've worked with over a thousand athletes since 2015. We've had 27 athletes drafted. We've coached over a dozen big leaguers. Go ahead and shoot us an email, contact at tradeathletics.com. And we'll see you guys in the next video.